And you're welcome back to the marketplace to our very first story. The economy is not completely immune from HIPIC or the highly indebted poor country status. That's the verdict of Professor Peter Korty, who is the head of economic department at the University of Ghana, Lagon. The debt to GDP ratio of the country is currently higher than 70% putting Ghana at risk of assuming a HIPIC status. These were highlighted at the inaugural lecture by the economics professor at the Great Hall of the University of Ghana. The national debt of about 122 billion Ghana cities constitutes more than 70% of GDP, making the country a high debt distress one. Economists say if managers of the economy don't control the appetite for borrowing, Ghana will be classified as a HIPIC country once again from its current status as middle-income economy. Speaking at his inaugural lecture at the University of Ghana, head of the economics department, Professor Korte, explained Ghana is not out of the woods yet. In the case of debt service to total expenditure, it is even above the pre hippic level. The bane of Ghana's economy is not the lack of resources, but the lack of judicious use of resources or getting value for money. Ghana has poor debt performance compared to its counterparts, Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria. Therefore, we are in a comfortable lead. <laughs> and we are cruising to hippic levels. I call for a clear commitment by government to reduce the debt ratio from its present level to 60% or below in the next four years. In fact, I call on civil society. Any attempt to increase the debt threshold is inhuman. We must stand against this. That is inhuman. Given suggestions on how best government could use bonds to address the debt situation, Professor Korte noted it would have been prudent to spread the risk of the recently issued $2.25 billion bond to several investors rather than dealing with a single investor. Lower interest and longer term loans used to repay expensive and short term facilities should be encouraged. And in fact, that leads me to the recent local bonds that were issued with all its controversies and, and what have you. I don't want to delve into that, but I would have wished to see in this bond that it was diversified. If you have just one optica, if that person decides to upload, there could be capital flight, it can affect your local economy. Uh, I have no reason to question the process, but I would have wished to, to see that we had more than one uh, institution buying rather than a single institution having over 95%. And away from that, Ghana should have another thermal power plant by December this year to augment the country's energy needs in the face of growing demand of electricity. Officials say the 400 megawatt plant to be filled with LPG and will be the biggest of its kind in the world. Lead contributor to the project Endeavor Energy says the plant upon completion will be the, among the country's cheapest thermal power sources. President Okufuado says the interest of the country will be paramount in negotiating the power purchase agreement with the private sector. He added the country is mindful of the challenges it endured during the recent energy crisis and has committed itself to ensuring the crisis will not recur. Five years, our experiences with power supply have been traumatic. All aspects of our lives have been affected. The economy has been damaged, businesses have been destroyed, individual and family lives have been put under severe stress, and our self-confidence has been dented. Yes, in true Ghanaian style, we have tried to make light of a deadly serious and depressing situation with jokes, but we all know that this is not an experience where you want to continue an extra day. I am certain all Ghanaians are agreed that never again should we allow ourselves to get into a similar situation. As your president, I know that the problem of power supply is at the top of the list of problems that must be solved. 
I'm here this afternoon because this project is consistent with our vision to make our country self-sufficient in electricity for industrial and domestic use to drive the socio-economic development of our country. All right, so let's turn our attention to the mining sector. And the U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Robert Jackson, has lauded the latest clampdown on illegal mining activities by government as well as a campaign by the media. He says the scale of destruction to the environment and pollution of the country's water bodies requires that the battle against the illicit trade activity is sustained. Ambassador Robert Porter Jackson was speaking to correspondent Nesta Kafwe Ajuma at Techiman during the three-day monitoring visit to the Brunhafu region. The Export-Import Bank of the United States funded the $350 million self-help electrification program which electrified more than 2,000 rural communities in Ghana. And on top of these investments, the Millennium Challenge Corporation's power compact will further strengthen the long-term health of the sector. The $498 million grant is the largest U.S. government investment to date under Power Africa and the Partnership for Growth. The concessionaire that will soon be chosen by the government of Ghana will be required to invest another $500 million over the first five years of the concession. That's a billion dollars going toward returning ECG and the other power companies to efficiency and profitability. All right, now moving on, the vice president of Sunvik Mining and Construction, Nuhu Salifu, has impressed on workers in the mining sector to look out for each other's safety in the course of their operations. According to him, this is key in protecting and maintaining indigenous human capital in the industry to the benefit of the economy. He said this at a ceremony to mark 2.5 million hours of work without a lost time to lost injury time by the West Africa operations of Sunvik Mining. This means the company's workers have in the last four years not recorded any injury serious enough to keep an employee away from work. Working 2.5 million man hours translates into working four years and four months without sustaining injury that we see any of us at the hospital or absent from work. So this seems a daunting task considering the precarious nature of our industry. Here we are again today taking lead in the EHS. 2.5 million man hours LTI free and counting. Ladies and gentlemen, at the time of our last recorded LTI on November 26, 2012, we resolved that incidents of that nature were avoidable and will not be allowed to happen again. This is based on our firm belief that accidents do not just happen. They are caused. Our simple logic has been that if they are caused, then they can be prevented. Over the last four years, this is what we have applied ourselves to, and this is what has brought us this far. Today, we recognize every employee and our partners, that our customers, regulators, and the service providers who have contributed to make this make. Now, car rental operators are making a case for government to grant them tax exemptions in their income in their operations. Government, as part of this agenda to empower the private sector to create more jobs in the economy, announced several import tax reliefs in the 2017 budget statement. This includes the removal of the special 1% import levy, much to the benefit of spare parts dealers, are Greek players and local printers. Executive Chairman of the Eurostar Global Limousine Group, Oscar Yao, says car rental operators also deserve such tax reliefs to boost its contribution to the economy. We take a closer look at concerns raised by car rental operators who say that government would have to grant them some tax exemptions as it has for spare part dealers. Early on, the government, through its 2017 budget, stated specific tax cuts to spare part dealers and as well operators at the ports. But car rental dealers say that an exemption of taxes that could go in their favor could boost job production in their area. We should get the same status like the, uh, the diplomatic mission. But 
if you use your car two, three years and you want to resell, whoever buys definitely have to then pay the duties. But how does government know that Dr. A, Mr. A is a car renter? Uh, that is why I mentioned that uh, it is important also, it is important for us to regulate ourselves properly. Then also most importantly so that people also don't ab abuse those kind of privileges. So that is why it is extremely important for us to follow through in our own house cleaning, reorganization, to reach a level where we can confidently um, feel or um, assess that, look, now is the time. When that moment comes, yes, it is important that we lobby government for many reliefs which go a long way to benefit Ghana, uh, to benefit in uh, domestic uh, tourism promotion. This concern by car rental operators have been replicated by key stakeholders in the tourism industry who say that an exemption of taxes in the industry could also help boost their production and help them remain much more competitive in this prevailing economic challenges. David Enim is the president of the Ghana Tourism Federation. I think that this is a time the government has to look up to the car rental operations in this country. Tax exemption, yes, why should people enjoy, others enjoy a tax exemption when others don't enjoy it? It used to be there, but how many car renters had the opportunity to enjoy tax exemption? Look at um, the business. It's capital intensive. One vehicle, Land Cruiser, can talk about $100,000. Not only that, then you talk about other services where um, you have to pay for uh, insurance, premium at a high rate, you have to have um, utility services, um, uh, uh, um, issues attached, then you have service uh, people, personnel that you have to work with. So I think the government has to come in and then support the car renters. Last year we had the same similar challenge with the domestic airline issue. And we went to the government, we did a lot of advocacy through the support of BUSAC. And this year, the government came in to say that, yes, the 17.5 um, VAT on the domestic tourism has been waived up. Why can't they do the same thing for car renters? So I think that the government, something can be done for the car renters. It's not a jealousy game that you are playing because they are also kind guys have something like that, so you're also calling for No, this is not jealous. When there's a kick, the cake should be shared by all and sundry. Apostle kind, yes, we agreed. And it's something that we appreciate that because we go there to bypass. So if the, the is reduced, why not? But then we are looking at the lives of people because we transport them from one destination to another destination. So if um, they are driving 40 vehicles and something should happen right now, who is going to be blamed? It's, it's not the car renter operator and it's not the government. Somebody is going to even accuse the government. You know, Ghana, everything is politics. People can even use that as politics. So I think it's time the government also have to turn and look at the car renters as well. And then bring them together as we are. And consumers with one need or the other, as far as car is concerned, have an opportunity to satisfy their desires this weekend. This will be at the automobile exhibition and farm fair, which kickstarts today at the Junction Mall, Nungwa, here in Accra. A three-day event supported by the multimedia group seeks to bring together perspective, prospective buyers and sellers uh, of automobile brands for the best deals. Ebeniza Amankwa is the center manager for the Junction Mall. We've seen that um, vehicles are no more luxuries. They are necessities of life, especially in the city in Accra. So we, we, we thought it wise that it would be necessary for us to put this together and to afford our customers and shoppers the opportunity to acquire vehicles without hassle and, and that is why we put this show together and Junction Mall being the mall with the wide, widest variety of um, offerings we, we, thought, we thought that it would be good to have this as well. Occasionally we are going to do this so that our customers and our shoppers will also have the opportunity of um, getting other things that you normally not get in a mall like a vehicle in a mall. Okay but uh, what type of vehicles are we likely to see when we come, when yeah, our customers come? Yeah, yeah wide range from classic cars to exotic cars. We are having SUVs, sedans, your dream car will be here. You know my I don't <laughs> <laughs> it will be here and uh, that is that is the essence of the event is to give us all the experience of cars that we've seen in movies, we've seen in the news, it's gonna be here right here at the junction mall. 
Meanwhile, the CEO of x -Dos Communications, organizers of the maiden edition of the Ghana Manufacturing Awards, which comes off later this evening at the Gold Coast Kempinski Hotel in Accra, has been sharing some thoughts with Joy Business. Mr. Richard Abbey Jr. says the event is aimed at encouraging manufacturing companies to help revamp the industry in Ghana. Latest reports released by the Ghana Statistical Service show the manufacturing sector still declining in contribution to GDP. Mr. Abbey underscores the need for innovation to help turn around the sector. Uh, we as organizers, um, and by organizers I mean Exodus Communications, believe in innovation. And uh, we do believe that you innovate or you die. And so with regarding the manufacturing industry, our, our core area is what we talk about, which is innovation and CSR, HSEQ and stewardship as well. But particularly, we're more focused on in innovation. Um, that's what we say, we're celebrating innovation in the manufacturing industry. Because to meet the international standards and also to grow the manufacturing industry, we need to uh, sort of innovate in order to meet the international standards and also compete international uh, uh, brands. Now, re reason for this award, like we say, apart from the, the, the pop and pageantry, I mean, and the fact that we want to also have a networking of, of manufacturing companies uh, together, we're looking at a future where we'll have a, a, a sort of a, an exhibition as well to exhibit some of these uh, um, uh, products of the manufacturing companies and then for investors and international community to come and see what Ghanaians are doing. I mean, we, we do believe that manufacturing industry it, it, it contributes a lot to the GDP of this country. And in that, if we promote more industrialization and promote manufacturing and reward these people. They will be more equipped and be prepared in order to do uh, uh, more, 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 more in, in the country. This is live on the marketplace and moving over to the Ashanti region. Once again, questions have always been raised about how oil revenues have been used since the country started petroleum exports. Records show the country has backed over 3 billion Ghana cities from oil exports since production began. The annual budget funding amount, or a ABFA, has four priority areas, including capacity building. But according to the Public Interest Accountability Committee reports for 2015, only 3.25% of the total revenues allocated to capacity building were directly invested in the oil and gas industry. Prince Apia has been exploring how best the revenues could be utilized and has filed this report for our Friday feature. According to the Public Integrated and Accountability Committee report for 2015, only 3.25% of the total revenue allocated to capacity building from 2011 to 2015 went directly into the oil and gas industry. Out of 274.97 million cities accrued between the same period, only 750,000 Ghana cities was used as counterfunding scholarships for some students from KNUST, the over 90% rest was spent on consumables, supply of teaching and learning materials to basic and secondary schools, feeding and capitation grant, BEC and SHS subsidy for 2015 examinations. So what do industry players think about this? Dr. Steve Mantiao is coordinator for Integrated Social Development Center, ISODEC. Except for the first year, 2011, we have not used oil revenue to build technical capacity, to build capacity specifically for the oil and gas industry. We even took two million Ghana cities of oil money and gave it to the Musicians Association of Ghana, Musica, in the name of capacity building. And the worry for me is the fact that this happened at a time when we have a dedicated fund for supporting education, the GET Fund, with a dedicated revenue stream, 2.5% VAT. So you ask yourself, if oil revenue funded all these projects, including even the free senior high school project of the government, then what did the GET Fund support? Energy Think Tank, Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASEP, has indicated the capacity building component be replaced with education. Ishmalaka is head of policy unit at ASEP. We believe that the capacity, component, capacity building component should be replaced with education. And it shouldn't just be school feeding and BEC subsidy and other things. We should have a dedicated plan that if we are investing so much in education, in fact, for the first place, what is the financing gap in education? 
If we know that we need 500 million every year in education infrastructure, you draw your plan that three years we are going to invest this much oil your revenues in education. Then you have monitoring and evaluation schemes so that every year you monitor to see if there are deviations you correct. Then at the end of three years we see that whether education has improved or not improved. God, the capacity building we are having now is very vague. Both the Petroleum Exploration Bill and the Petroleum Revenue Management Act stipulate the need for local content consideration in various aspects of the oil and gas industry. So I'm here at the Swami Magazine Industrial Hub where there are more than a thousand workers working in various aspects of engineering. In 2015, when they had a little push, they managed to build this famous smart turtle. But their only challenge is capacity building. That is what they need. Magazine, we have been neglected by the various uh, governments. We don't have any support from you anywhere. And moreover, they only use universities and then uh, big institutions like that. But as if Magadji people, we cannot do anything. But we are saying that we can do what Napoleon even cannot do about engineering. Now, what, what are you requiring from the government? You so say you can do that. We need government to take us uh, to have more uh, training. Because my people in Magadji, a lot of us are. Um, um, the education system is not good. Sapom Boating, is president of Swami Magazine Industrial Development Organization, SMIDO. Meanwhile, Vice President of SMIDO, Al Haji Abubakar Abdul Salam, has been outlining what Swami Magazine stands to offer. I know oil and gas, they need more of welders. We have so many welders here. We have so many experienced welders here, which they can do everything there. You see that our car that we bought, it is a, we use the welders here, we use, we use the straighteners here, so they are there. And I know they have mechanic, ma, uh, mechanics too, and yet we have so many mechanics, which there are certain things here, you don't need to go outside and bring engineers to come and do, and pay a lot of dollars to them. As for here, if you come here, we'll be able to do it for you. So there is a lot. As for magazine, as for machine, whatever it is, we can do it for you. Oil and gas people, let me tell you, the opportunities are in the magazine. The peoples are in the magazine. So-called engineers, they are in the magazine. So they and to the recognition of the capacity building priority area or stringent measures put in place to ensure government adheres to the task, revenue will continuously be misappropriated. Prince Apia, reporting. Now, innovation and technology are gradually gaining grounds in Ghana's banking sector, with many banks utilizing these tools to facilitate smooth transactions. Taking his turn on Joy News' business leadership program, the Executive Lounge, CEO of Stanbeck Bank, Al Hassan Andani, said looking at the fast pace of evolving technology trends in the financial sector, physical bank structures like buildings may soon become non existent within the next 10 to 15 years. I think at the rate at which we are going, my sense is that in the next 10, 15 years, if you told somebody you are going to a bank, he might ask, where is that? He might ask, what are you going to do there? We're, we're, in, we're evolving so quickly that literally everything that we're supposed to be doing in a banking hall will now be in the palm of our clients. That's our objective. So it started off to say, oh, you don't need to come and queue behind a, a cashier to take cash. Go to an ATM. Then it said, oh, you don't need to come to a cashier to, to find your bank balance. Go to the ATM. So we started to kind of strip. We're stripping you know, little things that happen in the banking hall and putting it on platforms. Let, now we're taking everything that happens in the banking hall and putting it on platforms. Sometimes, you know, and other markets have gotten to that already, we are in collaboration with everybody else, merchants, uh, supermarkets. So if you need a cash, you didn't need to come to the bank. Mm -hmm. You just go and give your card to the supermarket, and they'll give you punch, and they'll give you a cash back. And then you're going with your card. If you, if you needed to pay anybody locally, internationally, within Asian control, your card, your laptop, it's done. Instructions come into work because the sanctity of banking is 
your unique identity as an individual or a corporate. All right, so you watch the full version of the interview on uh, this episode of the Executive Lounge with uh, Al Hassan and Danny tomorrow, Saturday, at 6 p.m. on Multi TV and Joy News with a repeat at 8 p.m. on Sunday. That will be it for the marketplace today. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great weekend. My name is Emmanuel Abwaitiya.